it's a point lost on Californians, though, that goes, this is one of the reasons why independence is kind of an, impo- kind of an important discussion. Um, you see, we can watch it as it sits right now. This is a storm coming that, and just one of many. This is this is a storm coming that we won't be able to address until it's already gained so much momentum that it will be almost unstoppable for us. Hey, everybody. So this week, we have another returning guest. Hal Lohr is back with us. He is one of the co-hosts of the Red Star Report, the YouTube video series. And they're just starting their second season this month. So I sat down to talk to him about what's going on with Red Star Report and what new things he has planned for this season. And we also talked about just some current events and our thoughts on what's going on politically in California and the rest of the country. So I hope you enjoy the interview and be sure and visit uh, redstarreport.com and their YouTube channel and all their other social media, Facebook, Twitter, etc. So we are joined again by Hal Lohr, the host of Red Star Report on uh, YouTube, a video series. And uh, we last talked to you, it was about six months ago, I think. So it's been quite a while. Welcome back. Thank you. It's nice to have, nice to be back. So I want to talk to you about um, what's going on with Red Star Report and you're just starting a new season, season two, and what you plan to do with that. But before we get into that, I just wanted to start with um, just going over some general stuff. Like, it's been six months. A lot has happened. Um, what is your take on all the different things that have happened in the time since we last talked? And um, what do you make of it? I, I have a lot of thoughts about that, but I, I want to hear what you have to say first. that's a that's a good one actually it's a it's kind of a what hasn't changed in the last six months um politically speaking i mean we've watched we've pretty much watched as the federal government has spun nothing that will benefit california i mean we've watched the We've watched the police brutality bill go down in flames. We've watched anything having to do with gun control not happen. We've watched as Build Back Better became Build Back Bitter. Um, I mean, it's been a it's been a great six months for Joe Manchin. He's become a household word Um, from a federal standpoint. That's you know we haven't we haven't seen much. It's like it's been pretty disappointing on a state and local level. We've seen spikes in COVID. We've seen, um, we've seen mask mandates. We've seen protests. We've seen AB fourteen hundred, which I'm going to address tomorrow night, go down in flames, or basically go out with a whimper rather than a bang in this in the state assembly. Um, we've seen um, we've seen Candace Reed out in Riverside County get finally get uh terminated for her uh, for her indigenous her insulting indigenous video that will be on tomorrow night's podcast too um we've seen major organization we've seen one major organization or one former major organization in the california independence movement basically implode um it's been busy there's been a lot to talk about so yeah, Red Star Report is back for season two. <laughs> I guess we didn't get. I guess we <laughs> didn't get enough punishment from season one. Uh, 
<laughs> we got to we got to we got to come back and come back and get a little more and just get a little bit more of the the, the joy and happiness that are going on in California today, right? Yeah, I I don't see it getting any better. I mean, I saw the um the chat that you and uh, Shankar had the last episode of uh, the first season just kind of talking for 20 30 minutes or so. Uh kind of low key. It was uh it was interesting. You're just like, you can just buckle up. Things are going to get strange. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but. <laughs> well, it's, it's like to quote one famous Hollywood starlet. It's like, it's like, buckle up. We're in for a bumpy night. Um, it's, I don't, I don't see a lot of, I don't see a lot of rainbows and unicorns on the horizon for California in the next, in the next six months. Um, Right now for Red Star, we we're just going to focus on the next ten episodes, and we're going to hold on. We're going to try to hold on tight. Um, your last podcast with with uh, Dave Zogby was real good, by the way. Jeremy Zogby. Jeremy Zogby. Sorry. Yeah, I uh, I like talking to Jeremy. I we definitely have um, disagreements, and we don't uh, have the same viewpoint in a lot of things. But uh, as I said in the intro, I think he's a straight up guy, and uh, Definitely somebody that you can uh, have a discussion with in a civil manner. And uh... yeah, no, it's like we're doing podcasts. It's not like we have opinions or anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if you caught the uh, the episode I did on AB fourteen hundred. It's it's on it's in my queue. I've I've been I haven't. I honestly have only looked at a couple things in AB fourteen hundred because i i had I had things from a California independence standpoint that I wanted a I wanted a hammer on, and I didn't want to I didn't want to color it with too many with too many other points of view. Basically, I took basically i I took my points right out of the LA Times and the Sacramento Bee, which are kind of the go, kind of the go to for data when it when it comes to California California issues. Um, because surprise, surprise, we're not really covered very deeply in national in you know national media. Yeah, I I really tried to get into what I thought was beyond kind of the headline issues. Um, one of the issues that I raised was that even if we were to get this CalCare in California, part of the funding mechanism for it is to get these waivers from the federal government. Right. And whenever you are reliant on getting permission or requesting something from the federal government, that is dependent on who is there and what their feelings are or what mood they're in or whether they mm-hmm. like you or not, and that can be taken away at any point in time. So that's a big albatross around our neck, even to get some kind of state single pair. Well, actually, I was my thought on it when I was doing it was this would be a good conver- This could be a good conversation for you and I if we wanted to put together an actual show on it. In some ways, um, I purposely, and I purposely said, say in the in the podcast tomorrow night, I'm not going to deep dive into the, into the financial aspects of it or the difference between a a single payer versus a, versus true universal healthcare, because from a California independence standpoint, those differences or from, for Red Star standpoint, I should say for those differences aren't really pointing at the sort of underlying issue that we that we'd look at don't get me wrong those are those are the, those are the practical aspects that can say whether or not it can actually happen but from a california independence standpoint from an actual talking point standpoint what it really was about was this was about our state legislature looking at the fifth largest economy on earth and saying that we can't find a way to afford and we don't think you deserve national health care. I mean, and I say, it was like countries with, there are a lot of countries out there with 
bigger populations and lower GDPs that can that have done this for decades, they can afford it. So there's a question, why can't we and why won't we? But the idea that our actual state officials will actually look at this and go, nah, not going to happen. I mean, they didn't, it's not that the, it's not that it got voted down in committee. It's not that it basically couldn't, pa- couldn't pass financial muster. They just didn't br- bother to bring it to the floor. And that's telling that's, te- that's telling. I mean, when um, Ash Calra says, I don't have the votes. And he literally said that he did not have the votes by double digits. In a state house that has a three to one Democratic majority, it's like, I'm sorry, guys. It's like, you can't tell me you don't have the votes. What you don't have is you don't have the will. They don't desire to have this happen. Um, they look, I mean, they're looking at it and going, nah, it's not going <laughs> to, this isn't good. Yeah, this gets into something that um, we talked about on the phone a few days ago, which is that when you have such a one party state where one party just dominates everything and most of the population doesn't want to vote for the alternative because they, you know, think they're batshit crazy, which they are. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you're left with very little context or information about who you're actually voting for because a lot of people don't really participate in the primaries or pay attention too much. So what often happens is you just end up with a couple of random Democrats or maybe just a Democrat against a Republican. And, you know, what are you going to do? There's not that kind of competition of ideas that you would get if the kind of Democratic coalition in the state would have to break up into different factions that have different ideologies and different uh, different goals. And they'd actually have to present their case whereas as it is now it's like well we're just all we're all part of the same party and we can just kind of paper over our differences and no one is uh, the wiser for it i think the best bad assessment of it um i heard was kind of a joke that went it makes it too easy for the lobbyists I mean, if the lobbyists know that all they ha- that there's only going to be one side of the argument is ever going to be discussed, then they know that that's where they have to go. And there's no, and considering there's no way to get around it, it's like California's, with California's government basically being a in small version of the federal system and subject to a lot of the same pitfalls. It's a pay for play system. And if the lobbyists only have to go to one party because the other party has no pot, no ability to influence anything whatsoever, then we're just making their job too easy. And that's what happened with this. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they didn't even bother hiding it. I mean, the California chamber of commerce, the insure, you know, the national, uh, the national insurance industries, uh, the AMA, the California Medical Association, they they stand to lose money on this, and so they basically kiboshed it. They <laughs> they they, lo- they lobbied and threw a lot of money at it and killed it. That's it. <laughs> it's like, and if you only got one party, it's too easy to do. Yeah, that's very true. I want to take like a thirty thousand foot level my assessment of kind of what's going on. The first thing is just, I think we should acknowledge like how much, how much of our attention and focus is spent on these ridiculous national issues and national discussions, which is wasted time that we could be talking about things here. I mean, that's just something that I've just noticed the past year or two that we're so consumed, you know, with these issues issues at the the federal level and what's going on in uh, in America politically and everything else. That I mean, that robs us of time and effort to to address things here, and that's kind of that's one big takeaway I take 
at the, like I said, the 30,000 foot level over the past year or two. And the other is that it's very easy, I think, to to be focused in on individuals and individual events. It's easy to to get fixated with Trump and you know, what he says and what he, it used to be what he tweeted, but you know, now he doesn't tweet. He just has his little rallies and letters that he sends out, but it's easy to get caught up in all that and lose sight of kind of what the bigger picture is, which this is kind of what I see what's going on in America in general. And this is a process that is been playing out for the past 30, 40, 50 years. This is not something that's new to Trump. It's not even new to you know the Tea Party or even that recent. Um, and that is that around the 60s and 70s, I think we achieved kind of a high water mark in the United States as far as progressive legislation, civil rights, coming somewhat close to social democracy and those kind of policies. And it really pissed off a lot of people who did not want to go that direction. And there's been a concerted effort among various organizations on the right, a whole network of connected, related organizations and movements that have really been working tirelessly for the past few decades to undo that and to to undo that democratic progress that we made. And they've reached a point where they realize that it's a choice between they can maintain power or they can maintain democracy, but they can't do both. And they've chosen to maintain power. And they they say, well, to heck with democracy. If we have to choose between the two, we're willing to give up democracy if it means that we keep power. So there's there's a, a, a large segment of America that was in a position of power for a long time, and they were perfectly fine with democracy for 200 years or however long it was, as long as they came out on top. Mm-hmm. We can have a little bit of progress in other parts of the population, but as long as we're at the end of the day, we're on top and we're in charge of things. And when I say we, you know, I'm talking about white Christian men, you know, Mm -hmm. that's the, that's the people who have run the country for a long time. And as long as they ended up on top, they're like, they're fine with democracy. But now they're realizing that they can't, they can't hold on to democracy and maintain their power at the same time for several, many different reasons. And so they've chosen to give up on democracy. And so America has to decide whether it wants to be a, uh, a, a multiracial, multiethnic, liberal democracy that's, that's functioning, or if it wants to go another route down some authoritarian direction. And that's the crossroads that they're at. And that's, that's the 30,000 foot level that I see. And it's, mm-hmm. We have a lot of problems in California, and I'm not going to try and say that that we don't, and that we don't have a lot of work to do. But that is an issue that we're past. We 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 came to that fork in the road, and we chose one direction, and it's oh, we're mm-hmm. we're done with it. Like that's not. This is something that they're working through. That's that we've already worked out. Even even you know, moderate and conservatives in California. I mean, I know a lot of conservatives in California, they understand we're a liberal democracy. They understand that, yes, we have to coexist with, we have to share the democracy with other races and ethnicities and people who think different. And yes, we have, yes, there are, there are people who are, you know, the, the really far right wing extremists, but they are less than in the rest of the country. And, Basically, we've moved on past this. This is not an issue for us. But it is for America, and that's what they're going through. And that's what I see as the difference about why we feel so disconnected from the country and why we feel we need to move on from them. Well, in this day and being being part of basically an older generation, 
I am reminded of the immortal words of one of America's great uh, 20th century philosophers, uh, George Carlin, who spoke about who spoke about America as basically being owned. There is a class of people in America who are the owners of America. They own you, he said. Um, they own everything. They own the banks. They own... <laughs> it's like... <sighs> and at the time when we were watching him say these things, we were like... <sighs> Not, we, we, it, was, it was difficult, to, it was difficult to, to see. It was difficult to see. Now, we realize that that was exact, that was the truth. That was that was a that was a that was a, a a serious truth. Those people, the owners of America, it's like, and now we call them the one percenters or the or the billionaire class or the donor class or we've got a lot of names for them. Yeah, they were they were fond of democracy as long as it was as long as the game was rigged. As long as the game was rigged, I mean, they were good. When they started to no, no longer be the majority, or when or when the people that they could do were no longer the majority, they started to lose it. It has brought us to that "may you live in interesting times" kind of th- kind of thing. As far as the national media is concerned, yeah, we watch it over here, and from a Red Star standpoint, it happens all the time. It's like. You watch the national news and you basically go, what does that have to do with California? What does that person have to do with California? Why, how is this important? A senator or senators who were elected by fewer people than will vote for the mayor of Los Angeles can hold the entire nation hostage. And he's the bad guy. That guy becomes the bad, you know, that guy becomes the bad guy. And we can ignore the fact that the entire red state Republican party has basically just refused to govern. And yet we have Californians who have great faith in that system. Texas and their abortion laws. And it seems that Ohio is now doing a, Ohio is, (laughs) is doing a hold my beer on that. Um, these things are far away. In some ways, we, in some ways, it's like, what, is the, what do they have to do with California? But they're going to gear up to try to make that the law of the land. Eventually, they're going to they're going to go for they're going to go for women's reproductive rights as soon as they get a quorum. Yeah, this is what something that I've said um, a few times is that a, a lot of people seem to be under this delusion that overturning Roe v. Wade is is the end. That's their goal. <laughs> It's like, right. you don't understand these people. I know, I know these people I've been following for a long time. Uh, they're, they're fanatics. And they, th- that's just, you, you can't stop at one victory. It, you know, once they get that, they're just going to be looking towards, okay, well, that means, you know, when we take both houses of Congress and the presidency, we can just pass a federal law to ban it in all 50 states. I know that's on their plate. If they can do it, they will do it. It's a point lost on Californians, though, that goes, this is one of the reasons why independence is kind of an, kind of an important discussion. Um, you see, we can watch it as it sits right now. This is a storm coming, that, and just one of many. This is, this is a storm coming that we won't be able to address until it's already gained so much momentum that it will be almost unstoppable for us. Once enough red states pass these laws, pass these anti-reproductive laws, um, and once it becomes normalized, then by the time it reaches, you know, the hallowed halls of Washington, D.C. or the Supreme Court, who, let's face it, is guaranteed not to side with California values, it will be impossible for Californians to do anything but, you know, take to the streets and march, but we already know that they ignore that anyway. So, yeah, that, and a lot of things come down the pipe like that. Um, We just saw something happen 
I believe it's in Missouri. If you if you were keep if I don't know if you saw this, but they just passed a they're or they're pushing something through their state house right now that literally they're calling the uh, what is it make murder great again legislation uh, or something to that effect, where they're pushing something through that says that they are going to be instructing their courts that in gun deaths. All gun deaths are to be, are to be considered justifiable, justifiable homicide unless otherwise specified. Basically, this is being pushed by the NRA in a test case there. If they can get this through the state house, it's like, what does that do for California gun laws? It's, it's a shoot first and ask questions later law. What happens if that passes in Missouri? Then it goes on in Kentucky, or then it's, or then it becomes the law of the land in Michigan, and eventually, it, eventually this walks right up to right up to congress and we get a we maybe get a we get maybe get a republican president who is trump or trump worse well this is exactly what happened with the the whole kyle rittenhouse thing right Mm -hmm. i mean the from what i understand the logic of it is, is that the the state law um says that basically if you have a subjective a, a, a subjective uh, view that you're in danger, then anything goes. Yeah. Well, subjective. I mean, in, anything can be subjective. So, I mean, what it amounts to in practice is, like you said, shoot first, ask questions later, and uh, uh, whoever dies doesn't get to tell their side of the story, and whoever's left to to live uh, gets to recount their subjective experience. I don't know. There's no any words right. I can. There's, this is, it's in our ear. It's in, it's almost undiscussable in some ways. It's like, okay, so we're not going to even bother talking about the fact that he shouldn't have been there in the first place. I mean, you know, this is, this is the, I'm going to walk, I'm going to walk into a bar and I'm going to start punching people. But if they beat me up, I can sue them. What? Everybody, it's like a, this is one of the things I love about conservatives. They're all about personal responsibility until they have to take any. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you think about it, it's like gu- between guns and and women's reproductive rights and the fact that, I mean, Joe Biden, the guy that Californians voted for in droves to fix the country, just said in an, just said in an interview that he's going to start pushing to refund the police. It's like, okay, so all of that Black Lives Matter stuff that went down for, you know, <laughs> that's, you know, the the civil, it's like, so you're going to refund the police, but you're not going to do anything about voting rights. Um, is that going to, is that going to turn out well for California in the long run? I mean, what, hap- it, what happens when they start enshrining that stuff and they will do it. They will do it. By the time, again, by the time we're able to address it here in California, it will be too late on the federal level to do so. The thing that probably I should end this line on my part to get off the soapbox goes, there's one advantage to getting rid of the federal government in these discussions. And it goes, we can get at our local politicians. We can get in a car and we can drive to their office. We can... You know, we can send them letters. We can we can meet them in the halls of in Sacramento and talk to them. We can set up appointments. We can develop, you know, we can develop local committees and talk and 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 have conferences with them. We can anybody anybody un, under the illusion that we can do any of that with the federal government twenty five hundred miles away. They're under no compunction to listen to us because they don't because we can't. We can't get to them anyway. They're inaccessible. Yeah. And how does that ever does that ever work out well? You know, if you, if you got the, when you had the king in the castle surrounded surrounded by guards, it's like, and the peasants had a problem. It's like, did that ever work out? Did that ever really work out well? You know, it's like we have a serious problem. Um, you were talking about it earlier, but earlier in your discussion, in your discussion points ago. Um, yes, 
they have decided that they have decided that if democracy has become inconvenient, it can go away. That puts a that puts a that puts an aegis on the federal government, and we've seen it. The federal government can only entertain solutions to problems if it doesn't inconvenience the donor class. Why can't we have universal health care? Well, because it may raise taxes on businesses and billionaires. We may have to we may have to roll back tax cuts. Or we might have to not spend as much on the next you know, on the next aircraft carrier re- that replaces an aircraft carrier that's only 10 years old. I think there are deeper reasons why they don't want some kind of universal health care. I, I think I think it's about it's about control, because when you have health care, you don't have to worry about it. You're more free to uh, protest. You're more free to speak up. You're more free to if you're an employee to strike to form unions Mm -hmm. um, or to move to another job or move to another job. Yeah. Yeah. When you are dependent on your job for your health care, they got you right where they want you. That's what I think it's about. It's about control. We were talking about how uh, a lot of Californians are not really paying attention to what's going on at the national level and don't feel the urgency of some of these issues coming to our doorsteps. And this is a good transition, I think, into discussing um, what's coming up with Red Star Report and what you have in mind for it, because one of the things that I wanted to do so to reveal here, I'm going to be contributing some things to Red Star Report. But one of the um, things I wanted to start with was a series of short videos, five to 10 minutes on just this kind of thing. There are topics that people need to think about that are concrete. So concrete ways that you're going to be hurt or harmed or affected by staying a part of the United States, by staying part of this federal system. And I'm going to try and make it really concrete, like not abstract, because I think it's easy to get lost in the abstraction in a lot of this political stuff. And if you can put it in terms where, you know, like like we talked about reproductive rights, like, no, they, they, they're going to come to do this. This is on their agenda. And you'll be surprised when it happens, but we're telling you it's coming. They're going to do this with guns. We're telling you it's coming, you know. We're telling you that you're never going to get uh, health care at the federal level. And if you manage to get it at the state level, they'll take it away as soon as they can. They'll make it as hard to, to implement. They'll do everything they can to make sure it's a failure. We're telling you that that's going to happen. Issue after issue, environment and you know all sorts of things. That's what I have in mind for this series of short little things that I have in mind for, for Red Star Report is just to enumerate some of those and go over some of the the real world implications so that people can really think and absorb how this is going to affect their daily lives. It's really, it's not abstract. It, they need to think about how this is going to affect them. So that's some, that's something I'm thinking of contributing to. So what else do you have in mind for the next season coming up? What are you, um, what changes have you made or uh, what other uh types of segments you're going to have on what's the direction that the whole show is going in this new year and this new season the first thing we're doing with red star report is that we are bringing on more people we're bringing on people like you to, and we're bringing on people like matt owen um we're bringing on uh, sue hirsch she's doing a book review matt owen is doing places in history we're going to be bringing on even more people as time goes by to bring more points of view than just shank our eyes i mean we're activists our tendency as activists is to is to bumper sticker issues i mean you know when, when you are used to dealing with people across a table or across or through through a bullhorn you're it's very difficult to do deep dives into issues 
So we're bringing on people to help to help with that. People like you, and it's one of the reasons why I talked to you in the first place about doing so. Um, we are we have increased our production values. Um, we spent the first season learning how to do what we're doing. Now it's like the last one, the last video was, or the last podcast was the first one we actually did in stereo. That's a, that's an improvement. We, we've improved our technique and our technology. We will be adding more. We will be adding more to that as well. Yeah. Just to, just to cut in here just a minute. I, I noticed immediately when I was listening to the, the first episode of the new season, the, the improved quality, it, it hit me, you know, real quick. (laughs) So I, it's noticeable. Well, I've been joking about it. It's like a lot of Red Star Report has been teaching this old dog a lot of new tricks when it comes to when it comes to audio video technology. Uh, <laughs> but we're also going to be um, we're also going to be featuring a lot more a lot more people. We're we're exploring um, and discussions are reaching out. Uh, we're reaching out more to the indigenous community. Um, there's a lot of unheard voices there. Uh, Sue Hirsch just finished an interview with Lenada Warjack who is one of the founders of the American Indian movement. She was the first, she was the first native American student at Berkeley. And she was at the original Alcatraz occupation. Yeah. She, she was an organizer. She's written many books, incredible, incredible person. So we're going, so we're going to be talking to her and she, we're talking to her. We will be organizing some more. We're going to start organizing roundtable discussions. Uh, one of the things that we've been talk, talking about is that Red Star Report will this year, uh, this year, hopefully, hopefully within the, within this next, within this next run of 10 episodes, we will begin to be, we will begin to do panel discussions. We've been very, very sort of one way conversations, us talking at people. It's like now that we've been talking at people, we want to give people a chance to get at us and talk back. Um, we're also going to be, we've also approached um, the California National Party about having them come on board to give us updates on what's going on with the party, with the party and the party platform. And with, and as we approach the, as we approach the elections, we're going to be talking to candidates and promoting California independence candidates. So Red Star Report has has a lot on its plate. Um, we're now talking to a lot of the a lot of the older contacts who used to be talking to the movement back in 2017 and so forth. We're talking to Yes Scotland, and we're going to be looking to get updates from what on what they're doing and other independents. You know, other independents uh, movements across the uh, across the world. Um, the Catalonian independence movement. We've got a representative person or a person who wants to come on and talk about that. And, and we're going to be talking to the youth council for independence from Wales. Basically we have a, we have a full plate. My intention is to just continue to look to improve red star and look to broaden it to broaden you know, it's, it's reach a little bit so that, so that we can get more people and more voices. This California independence is not going to happen unless we talk, unless we talk, you know, unless we, we normalize it, we get it, we get this conversation going. It's one of the things that the movement hasn't managed to do yet. Uh, too many brass ring grabs, not enough, not enough, just get reaching out to people to get, to get the idea across on a grassroots level. I mean, it's where we make, we make no bones about it. Red star port is not unbiased. We're Cali- we're California. We're very California independence biased. We have to get that. We have to get that message out. We have to let people know that there is an alternative to this, to this ongoing, you know, there never, never a bit of good news coming out of Washington. Um, to do this, I'm going to, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep bringing in more people and I'm going to keep trying to host and organize and keep it all together. Um, very soon we're going to want to hear people who do, who disagree with us. But before we do that, 
and I've told I've told everybody before we start listening to people who want, who disagree with this, we want to establish what the ground looks like first. There's very there's very little talking about California independence, and there's a lot talking about what's going on in right wing America. I've heard a lot of people on that, you know, from that that side of the coin going, well, why don't you have any of us on to talk about what we're talking about? It's like, you've got plenty, you have plenty of outlets. <laughs> you've got plenty of places you can talk right now. We're talking to people who haven't had a voice. It starts with the indigenous. Uh, we're looking to, we're looking to have conversations with, you know, black lives matter in the, you know, in the African American community and the Latin American community. And, all these communities that basically make up what we know with, as Californians. Yeah, I think the um, the direction that the the Scottish have taken is a good direction because they went from a position that we are in currently several years ago, and they have built it up to a point where they have a, a big media uh, platform. They have conferences and speakers and. The point is that it's very evident that even if people disagree with Scottish independence in Scotland, it is within the the Overton window. They have put it there. It's it's within the the realm of legitimate topics to talk about, and that that's exactly what um, what we need to do. They, they've normalized it in a way that. When when somebody is talking about it in Scotland, nobody says, "Well, that's a that's a that's a fringy freak." <laughs> they they've gone beyond that. Uh, one of the things that even when talking to them, I love what they're doing over there, and we've learned a lot from talking to them, and we're we will continue to do so because yeah, this is going to be a learning experience, but. One thing everybody admits, it's like Scott, an ind- a free and independent Scotland is a wonderful goal. A free and independent California is a vastly bigger lift. We're orders of magnitude larger than Scotland in matters of population, um, uh, square mileage, and particularly in ethnic diversity. And it's not a bad thing to say. It's like we have a lot more. We have a lot more in the way of various communities that we need to reach out to, and that we need to get on board, and we need to have the conversations we need to have before we can reach where they're at. Getting free of Eng- of England is no small task. Freeing California from the United States. That'd be one of the biggest lifts independence wise in the history of the planet. I mean, California, California is now bigger, more bigger, more population, bigger GDP, more everything than the 13 colonies were when they broke away from England in 1776 by a long shot. Well, just the fact that we would immediately be eligible and almost obligated to be a member of the G8 is like, <laughs> like <laughs> we would be in yeah no it's, that's a discussion point that that is hard to get across to people people it's hard to fathom how do you how do you explain to people who are going well how how would you how will we survive without america and going we would be the fifth the fifth major world power i mean we'd definitely be a global economic power overnight um we probably could make it <laughs> You could probably make it as a country. I mean, uh, you know, Holland makes it as a country, and they're not terribly large. You know, uh, Denmark, they 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 do very well. Uh, Norway, Japan, we're at least close enough for, to do a to run a uh, an economic comparative, a population comparative, a land mass. They do okay. England, Italy, France. Uh, and then there's the whole rest of the world that is a lot not as well off as we are. I think that um, this this train is is out of the station and it's gaining it's gaining acceleration, and I don't think much can mm-hmm. stop it. And when I when I what I mean by that is just the momentum of what's happening 
in the U.S. So the analogy I used with you earlier was that we don't have to worry about building the train. We don't have to get the coal to put in the locomotive, and we don't have to. We don't even have to be mm-hmm. the engineer that that drives it down the track. We just have to lay the tracks. We just have to make sure that we're laying the tracks in a way to nudge it in the right direction. We don't have to try and get some big thing to happen. We just have to nudge what is going to happen in the direction that it should go. That's that's the analogy I use. the the term The term we we emphasize at Red Star is that California independence is inevitable. It's inevitable. And it's inevitable in a lot of ways. The only, first off, the only way it would not generally happen is if somehow rainbows and unicorns, um, everybody woke up in the United States and went, what are we doing? Oh my, um, we need to be one people and we need to, we need to stop doing these terrible things we're doing. And in my lifetime, I've never seen anything close to that. If the United States continues on its road to democratic collapse, economic collapse, sociological collapse, I mean, any one of a number of different types of collapse, then if there's no functional America, then or no functional United States, then California independence is, you know, it's a done deal. Gross economic collapse in the United States. It's like California would largely seek independence just to protect itself. And we don't even want to talk about what happens if we end up, if, if the United States ends up launching another massive war, all of these things lead eventually to California and Californians reaching that conclusion that we don't want to be here anymore. We don't want to be here anymore. Why would we want to? Why would we want to continue with this? I mean, the principal thing that's holding us, holding us to the United States right now, other than you know, other than the legal ties, is nostalgia. It's nostalgia. It's like, oh well, what would we do without Fourth of July? It's like oh, I don't know. We shoot off we shoot off fireworks on the Fourth of November, uh, or what do we do without you know? What do we do without apple pie and, you know, hot dogs and, and Chevrolet? It's like, well, first off, we can still buy Chevrolets. Um, hot dogs hot dogs and apple pie were, I think, German in, in, in origin. So, I mean, we can still do that. Uh, the things that we're nostalgic about, we still have. They're still there. That's not going away. Um, it's going to take time for Californians to realize this. It's a psychological break. I mean, I remember when I went through it a year and a half ago or so. And it was, um, I don't want to say it was traumatic, but it was, it was definitely um, an experience. You have to kind of psychologically ex- accept certain things. And, you know, you've grown up your whole life. You've been told these things about the U.S. and mm-hmm. how exceptional it is. and You know, you hear the national anthem thousands of times during your life and you're forced to say the Pledge of Allegiance thousands of times and go through all these rituals and just bombarded with propaganda for your whole life. That it is, it's a psychological break that is difficult for people to get through and um, we should be patient with them. But uh, I, I guess I have to apologize on that because in some ways, in some ways, being a member of the California independence movement is sort of like being the friend of someone who you realize is in a really terribly abusive relationship, and you keep saying, leave. You need to leave. You need to pack and go. Why are you sticking around? Why are, why are you letting them do that to you? And we keep watching as people go, well, we have to try to save it. We have to, you know, it's like, he, you know, he's not as bad as, he's not as bad as, you know, as you think. Um, 
he wouldn't have hit me if I didn't say, if I hadn't made him mad, you know, we, we keep getting this kind of thing. It's like, in some ways that is the California independence movement. We're, we're looking around going, yeah, we need to get out of here. You need to leave. You need to go. Why would you stick around in this abusive relationship? You know, it's like life will be a lot better once, you know, once we're not here anymore, but we are forced to watch for a while while everybody else starts to come to that conclusion. So where can people find out uh, more about Red Star Report and uh, find all your material? I know you have a YouTube channel. Uh, so this is your opportunity to promote all the different social media stuff that you have and where people can find you. All right. Red Star Report. Red Star Report. Our principal, our, our flagship right now is, is our YouTube blog. Our, our YouTube podcast. We are also on Instagram. We're also on Twitter where um, we have been for a very long time. One of the principal, um, one of the, pr one of the principal sources for memes and discussions and the original material and original content going out on everybody, on everybody's Facebook page, on everybody's, you know, on everybody's Instagram, on everybody's, uh, you know, we produce, we produce a fair amount of, a fair amount of the, of the media in general. I mean, wh whether it's cart, whether it's cartoons or blogs or what have you, um, we're going to continue to do that. We also have the website, www.redstarreport.com, which is, which we started and we are now updating and we're going to be including a lot more articles Basically, all the talking points, the frequently asked, the answers to the frequently asked questions that California independence people and people who are interested in California independence people want to find answers for, they'll be able to find in transcript there and with links to with links to those talking points um, in video, so you can either read them or you can listen to me describe them. Uh, and, but like I said, but like I said at the end of every at the end of every podcast, it's like. If you, if people want a California independence movement media group, it's all about the algorithms. Come find us, find us at redstarreport.com. Find us on Instagram, find us on YouTube, find us on Twitter, find us on Facebook. Give us a like, give us subscribe. It's not painful. Really? It's easy. Just push the button. Okay, great. Thanks for stopping by and uh, filling us in on what's going on. And, uh, we will talk again soon. Definitely talk again soon, and we'll see you on Red Star Report. We will. Thanks again.